one. Second question, I think I'm going to have a lot more hands. How many of you have not picked a company yet? Okay, I won't even say anything. Just pick a company, okay? Let's get started. Because this week, you're going to start talking about risk-free rates and risk premiums. I mean, very quickly, we're going to start working with the numbers. It's nice to have a real company to work on. So today, we're going to open up the first packet. If you did not get the first packet, no, don't freak out. The slides will be up there, but try to get it as soon as you can either in digital form, physical form, buy it, steal it, do whatever you need to do, okay? So today we're going to start on intrinsic valuation, okay? Let me go back and revisit what we're trying to do in intrinsic valuation. In intrinsic valuation, we're trying to attach a value to an asset based on its characteristics, its cash flows, its growth, its, as opposed to what? As opposed to pricing the asset, where you look at other assets like it and see what other people are willing to pay. So the key to remembering about intrinsic valuation is to apply intrinsic valuation, you need a cash flow generating asset. You need an asset that, that, that generates cash flows. And once you have that, you have to project out the cash flows and deal with uncertainty the best you can. So I'm going to give you two very different pictures of intrinsic valuation because when we talk about intrinsic valuation, the tool we generally tend to think about is discounted cash flow valuation. But discounted cash flow valuation is about probably 80 years old. It can be traced back to a paper written by John Bill Williams in 1938, dividend discount model, which we'll talk about a little bit today. So, but people have been valuing companies with intrinsic value for much longer than 80 years. So pre-discounted cash flow valuation, people did their own version of it without the mechanics that we've developed over the last 80 years. So we shouldn't act like we've invented this from nothing. So I'm going to show you two very different ways of thinking about discounted, uh, about discounted cash flow valuation, one of which you might never have seen before, but I'm going to talk a little bit about it. The conventional way in which we do discounted cash flow valuation is we estimate the, this is the start of the class test, I completely forgot. So I'm going to re reboot. Let me go, because this start of the class test we need to do, because it's going to be relevant to what we're going to talk about today. I'm sorry. Okay. You have no idea what I'm talking about, right? I sent you the test. So uh, you, can ask, uh, you can act like you've never seen it, but it is there. Okay. Remember the, the, the attachment I sent? In, I know at this stage you're probably sick of the emails you're getting from me. Okay, so reboot. I'll come back and talk about the intrinsic value, the two pictures. But I'm going to show you, for the start of the class, a very, a very quick perspective on valuation, and then use it to kind of illustrate a principle I want to talk about today. In a few minutes, I'm going to talk about two ways of doing valuation. And I'm going to jump the gun and show you the two ways. I come to you with a business and ask you to value the business. You have a choice. You can either value the equity in the business, I value the whole business. And this is one of those concepts that people have a tough time getting their heads around. So I'm going to give you the simplest way to think about the contrast between the equity in a business and a valuable business, and, and the business itself. Anybody here own a house or an apartment? Okay. You'll very quickly have to sell them to pay your student loans, I would think, you know. <laughs> but where do you own do you own a house in the in Seattle, okay? Do you own it outright, or do you have to borrow money? Okay. So unless you're a drug dealer, this is probably true around the <laughs> country. If you buy a house, you bo so I don't mean to extract uh, personal information, but how much did you borrow? Okay. Four hundred thousand, and the house and the apartment cost how much? I told you personally. So basically. <laughs> The day after she borrowed the money, and I'll use this as kind of an illustrative example, if I asked you how much the apartment is worth the day after you bought it, hopefully you would say 600000 If I asked you how much equity you have in the house, you'd have said 200000 Have housing prices gone up or down since you bought it? So let's say that the house, the apartment is now worth a million. If I ask you that question today, you're going to say the apartment is worth a million, and if you haven't borrowed any more, so I won't ask you any more personal questions, your equity is now worth 600000 But let's say this were a different period where housing prices had dropped. Don't have any nightmares, so this is just a hypothetical. 
Let's say that the apartment's value has dropped from 600 to 300,000. Now when I come and ask you how much the apartment is worth, you're going to say 300,000. When I ask you how much equity you have in the apartment, you're going to start crying. Because <laughs> how much equity do you have? You still owe 400,000. It's not like the banker says, oh, your apartment dropped by half. Let me drop the loan by half as well. You're, so the point I'm trying to make is you can have valuable businesses where equity is worth nothing. And that's why adopting this perspective matters so much. So if I ask you to value the equity in a business, I'm asking you to stay focused on just the equity investors. And in a few minutes, we'll talk about the specifics, but you're going to look at the cash flows equity investors get out of the business. And you're going to discount those cash flows back at a rate of return that equity investors need to make on that investment, given how risky they perceive. So it's all in your head, but you have to, so you might say, look, given the risk in this equity, I need to make at least 9%, 11%, 13%. We'll talk about the specifics of coming up with that number. But the first way to do valuation is to take equity cash flows and discount them back at the cost of equity. Now, if you invest in equity in a publicly traded company, what is the only cash flow that you actually get to see from the company? Dividends, right? Everything else is, you know, you can compute your, all the free cash flow equity from now through 30, but the only check you actually get to see is dividends. Remember I said 1938, the original, the very first discounted cash flow model was an equity valuation model where the cash flows discounted were dividends and they were discounted back at the cost of equity. Implicit in the dividend discount model is an assumption. You know what the assumption is? Companies pay out what they can afford to in dividends. And we know that that statement is categorically false. How do we know that? All you have to do is look at cash balance. It doesn't even have to be Apple. You look at every company, there's a cash balance, right? Cash is not manna from heaven. It's a direct reflection of the fact that companies that could have paid out, I'm not saying it's good or bad yet, but we know that companies that can afford to pay out dividends sometimes hold back. And there are other companies that actually pay out far more in dividends than they should have, especially mining and natural resource companies over the last few years that seem to think that you have to pay dividends no matter what. The point is, the dividend discount model is a nice model, it's a convenient model, it's an easy model to work with because everything is observable, but it comes with this fatal flaw, which is you're trusting companies to be sensible, rational, in the way they said dividend policy. And sensible and rational are two words I would not use to describe dividend policy. It's driven by inertia and me-tooism and strange factors. So we're going to talk about estimating potential dividends. Sounds fancy, right? But if you think from the perspective of dividends being residual cash flows, here's all I need to do. I need to figure out how much cash you have left in the till after you met every conceivable need, capital expenditures, working capital, debt payments. After you've made all those payments, how much? You could end up with no cash or even negative cash flows, but to the extent that you have cash left over, that is your potential dividend. Could I do this for Apple? Could I compute how much they could have paid? Absolutely, all I need is a statement of cash flows. I start with the net income. In fact, they've done most of the work for me. I subtract out the working capital change. It's right under the operating cash flow. I subtract out capex. I subtract out acquisitions. It's right under the investment cash flows. I subtract out debt payments. It's in the financing cash flow. And when the time I'm done, I'm going to come up with a free cash flow to equity for Apple. You know what that number was last year for Apple? $57 billion. This company is the greatest cash machine in history. $57 billion. That's why they could pay $20 billion in dividends and buy back $25 billion in stock and their cash balance still went up. Companies who died to have this problem. You're returning cash as fast as you can, but your cash balance keeps building up. So we're going to talk about estimating cash flows. But the key is, if you estimate cash flows equity, whether they're dividends or this more expansive version of potential dividends, which we're going to call free cash flow equity. Why it sounds fancy. It sounds like we've done something special, but it's really potential dividends. We're going to discount at the cost of equity. So that's the first perspective. There's a different perspective I can take. Let me start a business. You guys be my bank. You're lending me money. You guys be equity investors. I'm raising equity from you. I raise $150 million in equity, $100 million in debt. We have already talked about what cash flows you get. It could be dividends or this residual cash flow. Do you as lenders get cash flows in the business as well? 
You get interest expenses and principal payments, right? Now, we're going to play a little a strange game. It's going to be counterintuitive. Think of yourselves as partners in this process. After all, you both supply capital to me. Think of the collective cash flow you both get out of the business, which would be cash flow to equity plus interest plus it's, you see why it's counterintuitive? We don't think of the lender as a partner in a business. We think of them as an adversary. You pay the guy off, and then we move on. But if you think of them as a partner, the collective cash flow you get is called the cash flow to the firm. It's a pre-debt cash flow because we think of lenders as partners in this process. If that is the cash flow that I'm discounting, I can no longer just discount at what equity investors want, which we'll call cost of equity generically. I have to discount at a weighted average of what you guys want, which is the cost of equity, and what you as lenders demand it as a reasonable rate, which is called the cost of debt. That weighted average in corporate finance is called the don't call it the whack. Let's call it the cost of capital. Whack sounds so crude. Right? The cost of capital. If I look at the collective cash flows you get as a business and discount back at the cost of capital, you know what I valued? I valued the entire business. It's like valuing the entire apartment. And if I'm still interested in just the equity, what's the last step? Once I've valued the business to get to the value of equity, what do I need to do? I just need to subtract out what I owe you guys. And if I do this right, and we'll talk about this later today, I should get the same value of equity, but I'll also add the proposition that doing this right is perhaps the most difficult single task in valuation. To take a publicly traded company, value equity directly, and come up with a value for equity, and value the firm and subtract out and get the same value for equity. If you can do that, you've mastered DCF. <coughs> we'll hold off on that, because if you master it right now, then what do I do for the next 14 weeks? Okay. Let me show you a page, and this is the test for today. I'm going to show you an acquisition valuation. Remember what we said about acquisition. This is where valuation first principles go to die. It's a graveyard for everything good in valuation. And you're going to see in a minute why I use that description. This was actually from the 1970s. And it was um, for an acquisition by a company called Kennecott. Kennecott was a copper mining company, which had a coal subsidiary. And the antitrust laws had kicked in, and they were forced to sell the coal subsidiary. So this was about a $600 million company. They sold off the coal subsidiary. I'm sorry, it was about a $2 billion company. They sold off the coal subsidiary. They got $600 million in cash. And they got nervous about having that much cash. What were they afraid might happen to them? They're a $2 billion company with $600 million in cash sitting on your balance sheet. They were afraid that they would be taken over by somebody who used the cash to essentially fund the takeover. Now, if you have 600 million in cash that you don't have a need for, what's the most sensible way to get rid of the cash? Give it back to the shareholders. That thought never even crossed their minds. They said, what would they do with all the money? Stupid things like paying bills and you know, fixing their cars. We can't allow that to happen. So let me ask you a follow-up question. What's the stupidest way to get rid of 600 million? Go do an acquisition. So they went to First Boston, at that time, the leading M&A bank on Wall Street. And they said, we have $660 million in cash that we need to spend quickly. Can you help us? <laughs> this is like walking to Bloomingdale's with $1,000 in cash. Can you help me? I need to spend this really fast. If you're working on commission, you'll be surrounded by people who want to help you. First Boston said, no problem. We'll find the perfect target for you. And they did. And magically. That perfect target was going to cost them exactly $660 million. <laughs> this is another proposition. You tell me how much cash you have in your balance sheet. I will find you something that eats up all the cash. So, so far, it looks like any M&A script, right? But in this case, First Boston made a fatal mistake. They allowed this to become a Harvard case. <laughs> now, usually, I mean, the reason they were OK with it is every Harvard case is a strategic case which means nobody ever talks about the numbers. They bullshit their way around the whole thing. And then the, the exhibits are there just a show. And, for tw and for, it's probably still taught in Harvard as a strategic case. I'm not in the least bit interested in the strategic part. I went right to the exhibit. Because one of the exhibits, they had the cash flows that first Boston used to value the target company. The target company was car called Carborendum. It was an abrasive made, uh, you know. And 
this was the cash flow table that gave them that you, you could pay 660 million. So I'm going to describe how they estimated the cash flows. And what I want you to think about is what discount rate you're going to apply on these cash flows. Right? You already know enough valuation to be able to do it because it's a very simple proposition. So here's what they did. They started with net income. Then they added back you know, depreciation. They subtracted out capital expenditures and change in working capital, all the fancy stuff. And then they subtracted out debt payments to come up with their cash flows. Okay? They start with net income, subtracted out debt payments, and all the intermediate adjustments. That's all the information you need to know. Because now I'm going to offer you six different discount rates. Only one of them is the right answer. I want you to tell me which one of these discount rates you should apply. One is the acquiring companies cost of equity and cost of capital. The second is the target company's cost of equity and capital. The third is the merge company's cost of equity and capital. Let's start with the easy question. When I describe my cash flows, or how first Boston estimated the cash flows, remember we talked about cash flows to equity or cash flows to business? Are the cash flows they've estimated cash flows to equity or cash flows to the business, and how can you tell? You said cash flow to equity. Somebody said, why cash flow to equity? Because I subtracted out debt. Remember, I described cash flow to the firm as a pre. The minute you start with net income, you're already giving me clues. And now that you've subtracted debt payment, because remember, net income is after interest expenses. I'm sub so it's cash flow to equity, right? So let's make our job a little easier. Out of these six numbers, which, which column should I cross out because it shouldn't apply? The cost of capital column. So now we're down only three numbers. So now let's do some M&A 101 done right this time. Should I use the acquiring company's cost of equity, the target company's cost of equity? Or, uh, I don't want anybody to jump in, because I'm going to ask for a show of hands, and I want an honest show of hands, and not look at everybody and say, not many people are putting up, OK? Acquiring company, target company, merge company. How many of you think I should use the acquiring company's cost of equity? And what would your rationale be? Because they're raising the money, right? That's a classic argument for. So if I'm an acquiring company and I'm an acquiring safe company, then I should be able to raise money at a really low rate. Let's say I go and buy Bird. I raise the money at a really low rate. Do you see the danger of what you've just opened up? If I use the acquiring company's cost of equity, what's going to happen? Every risky company in the world is going to look undervalued to me. Not because it's undervalued, but because I'm subsidizing the shareholders of the company. See why I'm subsidizing? Because if I pay too high a price, I'm rewarding bird stockholders or equity investors for something that they had no role in creating. Half of all M&A valuations, in case you feel bad, half of all M&A valuations are fundamentally screwed up because they use the wrong companies this contract. The acquiring company should not even come into play. There's a rule in capital budgeting that you should have learned in corporate finance that you might have forgotten. You know what the discount rate for a project should be? It should reflect the risk of the project, not the risk of the entity looking at the project. So this notion of a company hurdle rate is an absurd notion, because if you have a risky project, you should have a high discount rate. The fact that you're a safe company can't make a risky project safe. So the discount rate you should be using should be the target company's cost of equity. You're saying, what about the merge company's cost of equity? There's one set of cash flows that you'd use the merge company's cost of equity on. You know which cash flows those should be? What's one of the magic words of distraction? Synergy. If there is, in fact, synergy, what's the definition of synergy? Combined firm creates it. So if you ask me to value just a synergy slice, then maybe the merged company's cost of equity is going to come into play because both companies are needed for synergy. But to value the target company itself is the target company's cost of equity, which is, at least in 1979, 16.5%. Remember, T-bond rates were 9 10%. Yeah. Now let's, I told you first, Boston leading M&A house on the street did this valuation. You know what discount rate they used? What's the worst possible choice you can make here? They use the acquiring company's cost of capital. This is about as far from the right answer as you can get. And that cost of capital is 10.5%. Think about it. You take their cash flows. You don't contest a single assumption on the cash flows. 
But all you do is use the right discount rate, the value you'd have got would have been 400 million for the target company. And how much did they ask Kennecott to pay for carburetor? 660 million. They got there because they used the wrong discount rate. Now, the cynical part of you might say, well, they knew what they were doing, but they wanted to. I personally believe that they really didn't mean this to happen. Because here's what happens in M&A valuations. There are two teams. One comes up with discount rates. The other comes up with cash flows. They don't even talk to each other until about three minutes before the actual valuation is going to get done. Because everything is on a deadline. Everything has to be done yesterday. So 11.57, they come together. By midnight, the valuation has to get done. So you say, I have a discount rate. 16, I don't even stop and ask, you know, 10.5%, what is it? So I have the cash flows. We're not explicit, right? We don't talk about what cash flows these are. So if there's nothing else that comes out of this, never ever answer the question, what's my discount rate? Because how do I know? Is it, are you asking for a cost of equity or cost of capital? And what are you going to use that discount rate on? Because giving people a number as a discount rate and sending them out to do things could be diabolical in terms of its consequences. So what's the lesson from this? When you see the name on the top of a valuation, don't look at the name and say, they must know what they're doing. It could be Goldman Sachs, it could be KKR, it could be Blackstone. It doesn't matter. Really sloppy stuff sometimes slip through in valuations. Do your due diligence. Anytime I look at a DCF, I look at the cash flows and ask, is this cash flow to the firm or cash flow to the equity? And sometimes all you need to do is say, this is a complete mess. I don't even know whose cash flow this is in which case the rest of the valuation falls apart. Any questions on that mismatch? So let me go now go back to the slides I'd started with, where I had this. So let's talk about discounted cash flow valuation. The conventional way in which we do discounted cash flow valuation, yes, go ahead. No, it's not. No, 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 wait, wait. St think about it. You're still subsidizing. Let's, let's say you're a really safe company with a 6% cost of equity. You're looking at a project that should have a 20% cost of equity because it's a risky project. You want to split the difference and use a 12% cost of equity? You're still subsidizing. You're subsidizing them less. Projects should be judged on their risk. Don't think about the overall entity's cost of equity. It is a marginal cost of equity. It's a marginal project looking at the incremental cash flows from that project. You're discounting back at its risk. The merged entity, that's why using a company-wide hurdle rate is so distracting. Because you're constantly being pulled to that, as if it's a magnet, right? I'm saying let it go. Okay? Basically, let each investment look at its risk. Sometimes, to make your life easier, you might classify investments based on division. Say, look, I can't look at every project as a standalone. Disney looks at a movie project. It should be using a movie business cost of equity and cost of capital, not Disney's cost of equity and capital. It looks at a theme park, it should use a theme park cost of equity and capital. The company really doesn't even come into play when you look at investments. Use whatever model you want. The merged company's cost of equity is going to be some weighted average after you've created this entity of what the combined company's cost of equity is. Where is it going to be used? If I'm valuing the combined company after the merger. So if you ask me, what's the value of this, you know, Disney and Fox after the merger? Then I have to use a combined company. But other than that, it never comes into play. Because you're valuing the target company. It's always got to be about the target company. So let's think about the conventional way in which we're taught discounted cash flow valuation. You take the expected cash flows. Notice the word I use, expected. Not conservative. That's the other thing to remember. Sometimes people do discounted cash flow valuations, and they say, I've made a conservative estimate of value. Stop. Give me your expected cash flows. We'll get conservative later, because if you start to get conservative at the cash flow stage, God only knows what you're going to end up as value. So get your expected cash flows, which means you have to make assumptions about the future, and you discount those expected cash flows at a risk-adjusted discount rate. Notice I haven't talked about beta, cap, and how you adjust for risk. We'll talk about the variations you can use, but you take expected cash flows and you discount at a risk-adjusted discount rate. That's the way every valuation book is written. There is an alternative way of doing discounted cash flow valuation that is almost never practiced, and we'll talk about maybe why that is. Instead of expected cash flows, 
I can use certainty equivalent cash flows. You're saying, what the hell is that? You seen that Howie Mandel show, what is it? Let's make a deal or no deal or whatever that is. No, it's on CNBC all the time. And here's how it works. Okay? Basically, you have a pretty stupid person up on the stage, <laughs> and they're given a choice of a guaranteed cash flow or what's in a suitcase up there. Okay, so let's play the game. Let's suppose that you're down to two suitcases. One has a million dollars and one has nothing. The certain equivalent is how much I would need to offer you to not take the bet. Okay? You think the answer is obvious, it's 500,000. That's not true. We're risk averse people. That's built into our. So if you're really risk averse, you might say, you give me 200,000. I don't need the bet. If you're not that risk averse, 300. So basically, a certain equivalent reflects risk aversion and what you're willing to do. You're saying, how would this work in valuation? If I wanted to value Apple with a certainty equivalent approach, here's what I'd have to do. The cash flows you saw in my valuation were expected cash flows. So let's say in year one, I have 31 million in expected cash flows. But lots of things could go wrong, right? The Apple 10, uh, 10S might not work, you know, sell as well. So the question I'm asking is, if I came to you as an investor, how much would I need to offer you as a guaranteed cash flow for you to give up your claim on the 31 million? You might say, I'd settle for 24 million, or 25 million, or 26 million. I would replace your 31 million with that number. And I would do this for every, you see why this is going to be incredibly messy? Because I'm going to ask you the same question about year two and year three. And if you can hang in there, by the time I'm done, every one of my cash flows is going to get replaced with a certainty equivalent cash flow. You think, where's this going? If I do that, then what discount rate should I apply on these cash flows? The risk-free rate, because my cash flows are already risk-adjusted. The reason it's so difficult to do is going from expected to certain equivalent. It's not just about you or I and what we'd accept. It's what investors collectively would accept. There's a way to do it. When I get to adjusting discount rates for risk, I'll show you the way and it'll give you equivalent answers. So people who think it's simpler are missing the point. But it also resolves a puzzle that some people, especially if they're worshippers at the altar of Buffett and Munger, have trouble with in discounted cash flow valuation. Warren Buffett has actually said that he uses a risk-free rate to value companies. And so whenever I do a discounted cash flow evaluation, somebody, of course, says, Warren Buffett says that you can use the risk-free rate as a discount rate. What they don't read is the rest of what he says. You know what he discounts at the risk-free rate? He's, he uses the word earnings I can count on, which means he takes the earnings, and he, if it's earnings that are you know, speculative or uncertain, he doesn't even count them. So what's he doing in his intu intuitively? He's basically replacing expected cash flows with his version of certainty equivalent cash flows. Can I then use the risk-free rate? Absolutely. But the problem, and this is why I think he does more damage than help, is people listen to that, and then you know what they do? They take the expected cash flows, which are risky, and they discount them back at the risk-free rate and say, hey, Warren Buffett told me I was going to be okay. <laughs> I hope he covers your losses after you've lost your your rear end on this because it doesn't make any sense. So leave that door open. So if somebody wants to talk to you about, hey, these are conservative, guaranteed cash flows, can I use it? Yes, of course. It's just a different way of doing discounted cash flow value. It's just very difficult to do it on ongoing concerns because you've got to do this over for the long term, year one, year two, year three. So let's do some intrinsic valuation 101. After all, everything I've said so far is that very first class you got in finance, right? Cash flows, present value. Let's do some intrinsic valuation 101. And I want somebody to be my guinea pig. I, I promise you, I'll make you look really good. I want somebody who's never done valuation before. You want to be my guinea pig? Okay. You already have a Seattle house, so <laughs> I've already made you a guinea pig once. I have to make you a guinea pig again. So I have an empty envelope. I have a $20 bill. I'm putting the $20 bill into the envelope. I'm not a magician, no sleight of hands, nothing. You know, so, uh, so here's my first question. How much should you pay for this envelope? Don't think too long. That can get you into trouble. What? 
Twenty dollars, she said, which is the answer I almost always get. So let me ask you a follow-up question. This is generic, generally to the whole. If I pay twenty dollars for an envelope with twenty dollars, what do I end up with? An envelope which I stole. Right? <laughs> First rule in valuation: If you know the value of something, never start your bidding at that number. And you say, which direction should I go? Please don't ask that question. <laughs> go lower. Right? <laughs> Start at a dollar. You don't know what disease I have. Maybe I can't read numbers. <laughs> it's asking for a lot. But you're right. This is such a simple asset that anybody, even a banker, should be able to value. So let's say we open this up for auction. The auction will stop at $20. So we now have steady state. Right? Now I'm going to make this interesting. I will need another guinea pig. Do you want to read to the class what this says? Control. Control. I'm adding control to the $20. <laughs> it's $20 plus control. How much did you pay for this envelope now? But it's got control in it. You now control the $20. You see why I use the word control? About six months ago, I did this at a Goldman Sachs m and Banker Group. This is a re-education <laughs> class to remind them of things they should have remembered all through. And one of the bankers decides he's going to be clever. And he offers me $24. I don't know whether he was trying to be clever or whether he really meant it, because in banking, you're supposed to have a 20% control premium. So I sold him the envelope. He said, I didn't mean it. I said, now that it's your money, you feel the pain, right? And think about it, what, what did he just do? He paid $4 for a 3 by 5 card with the word control. It cost me absolutely nothing to do. You can see where this is going next, so let's play along. What did you say? Synergy, I put that in there, brand new. I mean, I could write a dozen fancy corporate sustainability. You tell me the buzzword you want, I'll write in a 3 by 5 card. But the bottom line is, it's still worth only $20. In fact, if I got really desperate, I could throw in strategic and China in there. <laughs> It'll still be worth $20. That's why I call them weapons of mass distraction. Because what am I trying to do? I'm trying to get you to pay more than $20 for something worth $20. And I'm hoping that this word sounds so good that you're willing to pay the premium. So I'm going to state my first proposition on valuation. And it's very straightforward and it's very obvious. It's called the it proposition. If it does not affect the cash flows and it does not affect risk, what the heck are we doing talking about it? Let's take the word control. What's the value of control? Forget about the 20% rule. Forget about what bankers tell you. What is the value of controlling a company? You get to run the company instead of the existing guys, right? And what's the value of control then? It's a difference between two values. The value of the company run by the existing management and the value of the company run by you, because presumably if you're more skilled, better at management than those guys are, you should be able to run the company better and you should have a higher value. That difference is the value of control. And how much will it be worth? Depends on the company. If it's a company that's already perfectly managed and perfectly run, the value of control is zero. And if it's badly managed, it could be 100%. Who comes up with these rules of thumb and why do they even work? I'm not saying control doesn't have value, but to value control, you need to tell me how you plan to affect the cash flows and what you're going to do to the risk, and then I can value control. What's the value of synergy? Two companies coming together are able to do things they could not have done as standalone companies. When we get to the, uh, the acquisition valuation, I'll, give you, I'll, show you, I'll send you my, my link to my, or you can go check it out right now is when InBev bought SAB Miller, the biggest brewer in the, in the talk was of Synergy. I actually tried to value Synergy based on the higher revenues, the better margins, and I can come up with a value for Synergy. So I'm not saying Synergy does not have value, but to value it, you've got to do your homework. And what's the value of being in China? It's a huge market, so presumably you can get higher growth, but then you've got to do the rest of the work. Tell me what will happen to your margins. You can get lots of growth in China, but maybe your margins will, co will collapse. 
we have to go past the buzzwords because it's not just sloppy, it's dangerous. So it's the it proposition. Next time you're involved in evaluation discussion, as people bring up topic by topic, put them on the spot. You want to talk about brand name? Let's talk about specifics. Let's see how it plays out in margins and cash flows, and we can value brand name. The second proposition is what I call the duh proposition. It's named after my daughter, who's now 23. And I have four kids, and with all four kids, I noticed a fairly disquieting trend. Around the age of two or three, they thought I knew everything on the face of the earth. They'd come to me with questions like, Dad, what's the meaning of the universe? And I'd make up some crap, and they couldn't even check on it, so they walk away and say, Dad knows everything. So maybe because I made up so much crap, between the age of two and three, an insidious thing started to happen. They'd go to bed one night thinking I knew everything on the face of the earth. And the next morning when they woke up, I knew magically less. And this, once it gets started, is like continues. So basically, I'm getting stupider and stupider and stupider. My three sons stopped thinking about me because they were so self-absorbed by the age of 12. My daughter, though, was obsessed with how stupid I was getting. And she would tell me every morning, today, Dad, you're the 74th stupidest person. I don't know where she comes up with this list and how she knows the other 73. Yeah. But around the age of 16, she came in with a lot of fanfare one day and says, Dad, today, you are the stupidest person on the face of the earth. And I had a singular misfortune of actually sitting across the, the dinner table from her. And a topic of conversation would come up, and I would think I had something to contribute. I'd open my mouth, and she'd look across the table at me and say, Dad, duh. And the amount of contempt that oozed out of the words. I, I stopped talking for about two years. <laughs> Eventually, the good news is I started to climb the ranks again. Don't ask me how this happened. I'm still in the top 100 list, but I'm no longer officially the stupidest person on the face of it. So here's what the DER proposition for a special subset of emails I get every week. And here's how the emails will go. Professor Deodorant. <laughs> it's amazing. Try it out in Microsoft Word. If you type in my name and it doesn't know that it's in the name of a person, it tries to change it to deodorant. <laughs> Which I don't mind. At least I smell good, right? I'm valuing a money-losing company. I expect it to lose money forever. What model do you think will work best in valuing this company? So you're valuing a money-losing company. You expect it to lose money forever. You're planning to pay for this company? What's wrong with you? So let's get that out of the way. You sit down to do a discounted cash flow evaluation of your company, and you get negative cash flows for as far as the eye can see. Your company is worth nothing. Move on. There's no model that's going to give you. In fact, if we had a model that gives you a positive value, there's something wrong with your model. So the proposition is if you have negative cash flows and that's all you see, there is no value that you're willing to pay for this company. But let's make this more interesting. Let's assume you have a company, and I call this the don't freak out proposition because some of you will come into my office freaking out in about three weeks. Because you start projecting cash flows first. Your cash flow from last year might be negative, and already you're starting to freak out a little bit. And then you project year one and year two and year three, it's still negative. And you're going to come in and say, should I change companies? My cash flows in years one, two, and three are negative. I remember the DER proposition. And I'll ask you to hang in there. Because can a company with negative cash flows up front become a valuable company? It's kind of a silly question, because every company, the, the, the very best companies out there, at one point in time, were small companies with negative cash flows. In fact, what types of companies tend to have negative cash flows up front? Young growth companies, essentially. And why? Because they're not making much money, and they need to reinvest. It's, it's a feature, not a bug. But those companies can be valuable. But to be valuable, here's what has to happen. They have to get disproportionately large cash flows in the future. See why disproportionately large? If you have $10 billion in negative cash flows in the first three years, you've got to make $50 billion between years 8 and 10 to make up for it because you've got time and risk working against you. That negative cash flow up front is called cash burn. People freak out. They do weird stuff. They act like it's unnatural. It is part of investing in young growth companies. So during the class, when I value my young growth companies, 
Don't be surprised to see negative cash flows in the first four, first five, first six years because that's what you need to do to get that growth payoff in the future. So with that set up, let's go back. So the, you already saw this page. This is my equity page, right? You can discount cash flows to equity at the cost of equity. And you can define cash flows to equity very narrowly as dividends or more broadly as potential dividends. Alternatively, you can value the entire firm. Okay, so basically you can take cash flows. The cash flows have to be after debt payments and you discount them at the cost of equity. The alternative is to look at the cash flows collectively for equity investors and lenders and discount those cash flows back at the cost of capital. And what you get as a present value will be the value of the entire firm. And to get to the value of equity, as I said, you need to subtract out debt. I know we're not deep into the class and this is going to be an unfair question, but let's talk about the debt I should be subtracting. Now let's see if you can reason your way to an answer even if you've never done this kind of cash flow evaluation. So I take cash flow as the firm, which is the collective cash flow. I discount the cost of capital. I come up with the value for the entire firm. I'm trying to think of the debt I need to subtract out to get to the value of equity and I'll give you the choices and you tell me which one you think is the right choice. I could subtract out only long-term debt because after all, business is run with long-term debt. Short-term debt is you know, kind of rolled over. I could subtract out all debt, long-term as well as short-term. I could subtract out whatever I call debt in my cost of capital. Remember, to get a cost of capital, I needed a debt number to get to the cost of capital. Or maybe I should be subtracting out all liabilities, which includes supplier credit, accounts payable, et cetera. Long-term debt, total debt, whatever I call debt in my cost of capital, or everything on the liability side of the balance sheet which is not equity. Anybody want to give it a shot? You said C, why is that? In fact, I'll give you a much simpler way to, to do it. It's a consistency issue. Once I define something as debt in my cost of capital, then the cash flows have to be consistent with that debt and what I subtract out to get the value of equity. So you know what we're going to count as debt and I'll give you a preview. We're going to count all interest bearing debt, short term as well as long term. You know what else we're going to bring into debt? Something that accountants are waking up to this year but has always been true, which is leases have always been debt. In 2019, accountants have finally joined the bandwagon. So when I value companies, I treat all of that as debt, which means once I value the company to get to value by equity, I need to subtract out all of that debt. Don't worry if you're still struggling with that notion. We're going to get to the specifics. You can see this play out. But let me ask you a second question, and I'd like you to at least give me a gut answer. I said there were two ways you can get the value of equity. One is to get equity cash flows discount at the cost of equity, come up with the value of equity. The other is to value the whole business and subtract our debt to come up with the value of equity. So here's my first question. It's got nothing to do with the right. Would you like to get the same value for your equity with both approaches? I certainly would. Can you imagine going to your managing director and say, look, you asked me to value the equity in the company. I did it twice. Once I discounted cash flows to equity, the cost of equity so was $8 per share. Then I took the value of the firm and subtracted our debt, and I got $20 per share. The stock price is 15 You decide what to do. You will not have a job for very long, Rick. I mean, if this were any kind of consistent world, you, need, you should get the same answer. You're not reinventing the wheel, you're just taking different perspectives. So I'm going to cheat and give you an example where I get the same answer. And then I'm going to give you a way of figuring out what you need to assume for the same answer to apply. So I'm going to give you a company. And again, for the moment, just hang in there. If you've never seen discount rates and cash flows, it's all going to come out of nowhere, but just kind of hang in on what the big things we're going to do are. Here's a company where I have cash flows to equity in the second column, which I've estimated. And then cash flow to the firm, which is a pre-debt cash flow in the last column. This company's cost of equity is 13.625%. And its pre-tax cost of debt is 10%, but it has a tax rate of 15%, which means that its after-tax cost of debt is only 5%. It has $1,073 million in equity. That's the market value of equity. And the market value of its debt is $800 million. What are we going to do with these numbers? Let's first try to value the equity in this company. So remind me again, when I value equity, what I'm going to do? I'm going to take cash flows to equity and discount them back at the cost of equity, right? When I discount cash flows to equity at the cost of equity, the value that I get for the equity 
is 1,073 million, which means that the stock is perfectly priced. So discount cash dot equity, the cost of equity. What's the second way I can approach valuation? Take a weighted average of my cost of equity and cost of debt, and that weighted average is 13.625% weighted by the equity I have in the company, plus the after-tax cost of debt of 5% weighted by the debt, I get a cost of capital of 9.94%. I discount the cash flow to the firm, the pre-debt cash flow at the cost of capital. I get a present value of 1,873 million for the firm. What's the last step? I need to subtract out the 800 million. Magic, we got the same value. I cheated by not telling you the implicit assumptions I made along the way. I'm not going to tell you what those implicit assumptions are. Because remember I told you you're going to get a weekly challenge? This week's weekly challenge is I'm going to send you a very simple company. And I'm going to ask you to value the equity first. I'm going to give you. So it's going to be very basic. Even if you've never done valuation, I'll give you the. So basically, all you need to do is know how to hit the present value button in the calculator. Come up with the value for your equity. Then I'm going to ask you to do the value of the firm and subtract our debt. And the value of equity you're going to get is going to be different. And then I'm going to ask you, what do you think caused this difference? Because as I said, if you can figure that out, you've essentially plumbed depths of discounted cash flow valuation that most people who practice it haven't even looked at. Okay? So I'm going to leave that as a weekly challenge because as I said, this is a choice you're going to have to make in about six or seven weeks when you sit down to value your company. So what do I do? Understanding why they give you the same answer and what to do when they give you different answers is part of what's going to drive that choice. So here's my first principle. Yes, go ahead. Okay, that's a very good question. Why do we use market value of equity and debt? Does anybody want to try? Why in computing cost of capital? Same understand. thing, same principle, right? It's, 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 it, which is, no. It's, uh, why market equity? If you have trouble with market debt, you should have just as much trouble with market equity. Because I can sell the firm and then use the cash to settle your debt. And At what rate? You can remember you buy the debt back. At market value of debt, basically the way to think about any cost of capital is this is what it'll cost you to acquire the whole firm in the market today. So let's suppose you have a bunch of high interest rate debt out there. The market value of debt is going to be much higher than the book value of debt. You're not going to be able to retire the debt at book value. Those guys have contractual commitment. So the reason we use market values is because that's what you'd have to pay today to acquire the firm. It's kind of a quasi-acquisition valuation every time we do a DCF. Another implicit assumption we never quite examine until we start looking under the rock. But you're actually on to one of the things that cause equity valuations and firm valuations to diverge is those weights. So keep thinking about that because that's going to give you the clue about why the two numbers can diverge. So let's state the first principle, and this is something I want you to think about because it comes out of that pre-class test, at uh, the start of the class test. It's a consistency principle. If you give me cash flows, the discount rate should reflect how you estimate the cash flows. And if you discount equity cash flows at a cost of capital, all is lost. You take discount cash flows of the firm at the cost of equity, all is lost. Notice the word I used, all is lost. But he said, I put so much time and effort in estimating the cash flows with discount rates, you mismatch them. You've just wiped out days or weeks of work because you've mismatched them. So before you get caught up in the mechanics of what you're doing, step back and make sure you're being consistent because this is the principle we'll draw on for other aspects of discounting as well. In fact, put a big X on this page because when you're doing the quiz, I don't want you to end up in this page and do the wrong things because these are things you should not do. Discounting cash flow equity at the cost of capital, you'll end up with too high a value. That's exactly what Kennecott did, in the, or at least first Boston did with Carbon. They, of course, used the wrong companies but they discounted cash flows to equity at the cost of capital. If they discounted cash flow to the firm at the cost of equity, you get the reverse problem. You get too low a value because you're discounting cash flows to all claim holders at an equity cost. That's if you remember to subtract out the debt. But by the time you discount cash flow to the firm at the cost of equity, you might be so confused about what you value, you might just forget to subtract out the debt. I've seen all three happen in actual valuations with hundreds of millions of dollars at play. So don't assume again that just because you see it on paper and somebody signed off that it actually makes sense because the consistency principle is so easy to miss if you get caught up in the details.
So now we're ready to start taking our first steps into discounted cash flow evaluation. This is going to stretch for the next 10 sessions. Basically, we're going to spend a lot of time in the input because until you get the mechanics, everything else is going to get murky. So we're going to start off by talking about discount rates. So the next four or five sessions is going to be about discount rates, both cost of equity and cost of capital. And we're going to talk about nominal and real, and we'll draw the contrast. So the first stretch is going to be discount rates. Hopefully, some of this should be reviewed, but I will assume nothing. Because all the stuff you learned about cap, this is in service of discount rates. That's all of that stuff. The next step, nothing you've learned has actually you know, prepared you enough for, because it's about cash flows. It's amazing how much of time we spend in finance coming up with a discount rate, and how little time we talk about margins and cash flows. So we're going to talk about cash flows, not future cash flows, but get the cash flows from last year nailed down. Let's get, you know, before we get ambitious, let's get the numbers we should know nailed down. And you're going to see, I mean, If, if somebody could do that, it'll be great. So when you talk about discount rates, that's going to be the first half. Second half, we're going to get the cash flow from last year. And as I said, it's not as simple as it sounds. There are lots of little details that will trip us up. Okay? Third question is when the rubber meets the road, which is future cash flows. And this is where you're going to start to get uncomfortable. And you should, because you're playing God. Cash flows next year, two years out. And then we're going to close the process by computing what we call a terminal value, which is we do it for convenience because we can't keep estimating cash flows forever. Terminal value is our mechanism for putting closure on evaluation. And it's where the most damage often gets done. And finally, we'll also talk about what kind of model works best. You know, should you use an equity cash flow? So this is a process by which we're going to get ready to do valuations, but if you spend enough time in this process, the valuation part is going to come much more easily. So let's start with some generic structures. In any discounted cash flow model, here's what my valuation looks like. And I don't like spreadsheet valuation, so every valuation you're going to see is going to take the form of a picture so you can see where the numbers are coming from. So generically, to do a discounted cash flow evaluation with its equity firm dividends, here's what I'm going to start with. I'm going to start with cash flows, and those cash flows can either be before debt payments, in which case their firm cash flows are after debt payments. Okay. Then I need a discount rate. That discount rate can either be to equity investors, which is cost of equity, or to the entire firm, which is cost of capital. And then I said this, you need closure. And let me explain why you need closure. You remember that present value equation I showed you for intrinsic value? What did I say? The value of an asset is the present value of the expected cash flows over its lifetime. Okay? Now, if, we, if I ask you to value a building with a five-year life. Thank you so much. If I give you a building with a five-year life, you're going to estimate cash flows for five years. You're going to discount them back and come up with the value of the building. But five years, you're done. Capital budgeting projects usually have 5, 10, 15 year lives. Now, what are we trying to do, though? We're trying to value publicly traded companies. So what's the life of Apple? Now, open a corporate chart. It tells me when the company was founded, but it doesn't tell me when the company will be wound up, right? So at least in theory, the company can keep going and going and going and going forever. So what do I need to do to value Apple? I need to estimate cash flows forever. This is my vision of hell. First, I show up in hell. I don't want to be there. He says, welcome to hell. I don't want to be here, but I guess I have no choice. So what am I going to do? You're going to be doing a lot of discounted cash flow valuation. 
said, OK, I don't mind that. I kind of like it. So that's, you know. And he says, on this computer, and he points me towards a Dell. <laughs> My vision of hell is already taking form. I'm a Mac user, but I guess all the Macs are in heaven. I'm stuck with a Dell. You know, one of the Dells with the blue back or the red back, they thought that this made them cosmetically attractive. So I sit down on a Dell. He says, what company am I going to be valuing? He says, G. over and over again for the rest of eternity. It's like Groundhog Day. Every day you wake up to value GE again. <laughs> now, how many years am I projecting cash flows? Forever. It's a spreadsheet that never ends. No wonder in the real world, the question you ask is, and you, this is a constant refrain, is can I stop now? How about right now? And I have an answer, and you're not going to like my answer. You can stop if you're willing to make an assumption. You know what the assumption is? That beyond that point in time, your cash flows grow at a constant rate forever. What that buys you is an infinite series in mathematics. And 200 years ago, mathematicians solved for the value of that infinite series. We stole it in finance. We act like we invented this. But this is that magical terminal value equation you see. You know, but to use it, what do I need? I need to assume your cash flows grow at a constant rate forever. We're going to come back and kind of like a dog with a bone, we're going to go at this over and over again. But that's what the terminal value is basically making that assumption. That's what every discounted cash flow model has to do to get closure. Yep. That's actually a very good point you made. A lot of people, if you look, in fact, 80% of banking valuation, you know where the terminal value comes from? By applying a multiple. In which case, you haven't done an intrinsic valuation. You've just done a forward pricing. There's nothing wrong with a forward, but don't go through this charade of saying, I'm doing a discounted cash flow. Look cash flow, look cash flow. Look. And while I'm distracted, you slip six times EBITDA into your file. If you want to price things, price them. If you want to value them, value them. But if you mix the two up, you end up with something that's neither fish nor fur. And it's not, it, it, but it's common, as I said. But so if it's an intrinsic valuation, you have to stay with that growth rate. Now, of course, already I can hear. I mean, if you're thinking about this, you're saying, "But what if my company is not going to last forever? What if you're going to see there's a lot more flexibility?" Did I, when I said growth rate forever, did I say it has to be a positive number? No, you can have a minus 5% growth rate forever, in which case your company actually will shrink and disappear. We're going to see there's a lot more flexibility built into this model that people never use, but they like to complain about it. So in any discounted cash flow model, you need cash flows, you need discount rates, you need the terminal value. And how you estimate them is what's different across the different models. So let's start easy. What was the oldest discounted cash flow model in use? A dividend discount model. Let's see what this model looks like in a dividend discount model. Your cash flow is going to be dividends. Your discount rate is going to be a cost of equity because it's a cash flow to equity investors. And your terminal value will then be whenever you think dividends will start to grow at a constant rate forever. So in a dividend discount model, cash flows are dividends, so you have to project out future dividends. You discount them back at the cost of equity and apply closure by assuming dividends grow to concentrate forever beyond year five, year 10, et cetera. Now let's move forward. Let's assume you don't trust dividends because we know companies don't pay out what they can afford to in dividends. You're going to replace dividends with potential dividends, that free cash flow equity. Cash left over after you've met every conceivable need and every debt payment. You're going to discount those cash flows back at the cost of equity, and you will stop estimating cash flows when you're willing to assume that your free cash flow equity will grow at a constant rate forever. Not that different, right? All you've done is replace dividends with free cash flow equity. Let's move one step further up the ladder. I could look at cash flows before debt payments, free cash flow to the firm. The discount rate then will be the cost of capital, and you will stop estimating free cash flow to the firm when you assume that the free cash flow to the firm will grow at a constant rate forever. What I'm trying to say is we think we reinvent the wheel every time of the discounted cash flow model. We're just taking a different perspective because all three models share the same roots. So if you look at a dividend discount model, here's what it looks like. Oldest discounted cash flow model. You start with last year's dividends and last year's net income. Then you project out future dividends. And if you are, want to be fancy, you can first project out net income and assume a payout ratio that changes over time if you have a company that has a very low payout ratio. 
but eventually you get to steady state and you say beyond this point in time, my income and dividends are going to grow at a constant rate. You discount your dividends back at the cost of equity, you're done. Your value, the present value is your value per share. If I do free cash flows equity, it looks very much the same, except I have to do a little more homework. Rather than trusting your dividends, I'm estimating what you could have paid in dividends. And I'm going to give you the definition first, but we'll come in and flesh this out in a lot more detail later. I'm going to start with your net income. Remind me again why I'm starting with net income? Because these are cash flows to equity. Net income is the income to equity investors. I'm going to add back depreciation. Why? Because it's a non-cash expense. I'm going to subtract out CapEx because I've got to pay for it, even though the accountant says it's not an expense. And if there's working capital going up that's tying up more cash flows, then it's the last step. If I have to make debt payments, I subtract that as well. And what I'm left with is a truly residual cash flow, free cash flow equity. But the rest of the model, once I've done that, looks very much like the dividend discount model. Wherever I have dividends, I now replace them with free cash or equity. It's a lot more estimation work, right? Because I can't just do a payout ratio. I have to do depreciation, capex, and working capital. But the payoff I get is I get a more realistic estimate of the cash flows. I discount them at the cost of equity, and I value the equity in the company. And finally, if you look at firm Oh, incidentally, one of the things we'll talk about is non-operating assets. So we'll come back and address that. But let me do that in the context of valuing the firm. When I want to value the firm, I need cash flows before debt payments. So rather than start with net income, I'm going to start with the operating income. I won't, uh, I won't push you on your accounting knowledge because you don't need that much to do valuation. But if you remember an income statement, the operating income is an intermediate stop. It's not the proverbial bottom line. But an operating income is before interest expenses. So I start with operating income because I need an income before interest expenses. And that's going to create a whole lot of consequences I have to come back to later in the process. And you're going to see why in a few minutes. But I take that operating income. I act like I pay taxes. So taxes I still have to pay. And then I subtract out change in working capital, capex, just like I did. You know what I don't subtract out, though? I don't subtract out debt payments because these are pre-debt cash flows, free cash flows of firms. I discount those at the cost of capital. And what I get as a present value is the value of the operating assets in the company. So let me ask you a question, and I'm not trying to be mysterious. I take free cash of the firm, define the way I have. I discount at the cost of capital, and I come up with the present value. What have I not valued yet? What's still left on the table? Let's start with Apple. What have I not valued yet when I do this? Remember the number I started with is the operating income. So basically, any asset whose income is not part of operating income, I have not valued yet. $250 billion in cash. You know what the interest income from cash shows up? Below the operating income line. This is true across IFRS gap. So when I value Apple using free cash for the firm, I haven't valued And you're saying that's petty cash? That's $250 billion in petty cash? So you've got to add cash back. That's going to be the easy fix. You know what else I haven't valued? What other asset does a company have whose income doesn't show up as part of operating income? Now we're in the future. I'm sorry? Well, remember, though, that you've got to be careful. If you have an asset that doesn't generate cash now but could generate cash in the future, you're still counted. So a patent which is non-viable is still showing up in your future growth and cash flows. What happens when you own 5% of another company? What is it classified as by accountants? A minority holding. You know what happens in income from minority holdings? They show up below the operating income line. You see, how big a deal can this be? If I get a chance, I'll show you my Yahoo valuation from 2014. The value of Yahoo as a standalone company is about $4 billion. Why is it so low? And what would you pay for a search engine that nobody searches on? and a mail program that nobody sends. It's basically the operating assets that shrunk. But it's trading at about $39 billion. That sounds absurdly overvalued, right? But there were two investments that Yahoo had that I hadn't valued when I did my free cash flow of the firm and the cost of capital. What are those two assets? Two. One was 21% of Alibaba. This was right at the time they went public at a $200 billion market cap. What's 21% of $200 billion? A lot of money. And 35% of Yahoo Japan, and for some reason, the Japanese still seem to use Yahoo. Don't ask me what's different about the Japanese. And the Yahoo Japan is actually a standalone company that does pretty well. 
those are minority holdings, and when I did my free cash flow of the firm and discovered the cost of capital, those were still off the table. I had to explicitly bring them in. And if this is a world where I'm truly doing intrinsic valuation, what should I then do to complete this valuation? I can't just take the market price of Alibaba and the market price of Yahoo Japan and feed it in because then 80% or 90% of my value is just a price fed in. So to value Yahoo right, I actually had to value Alibaba and value Yahoo Japan. You're saying, what a pain in the neck. Hey, if you try to value Samsung, get ready for some nightmares. Or any company with lots of cross holdings, you think you're done, but your job has just begun. Because you have so much stuff that's not included in the operating room. You can't consolidate on your own. You can't go around consolidating things that don't belong to you yet. Consolidation works only if you own more than 51%. So you're saying, just create this artificial consolidated cash flow. What discount rate would you have to discount it then? A weighted average of the three. You know what? It's easier to leave them as standalone companies and value them as standalone companies than to try to create a consolidated statement that's artificial. Because these are three separate companies. So you probably you, you could create an artificial statement and if you do it right, get the same answer, it's gonna be a lot more work. So when you have cross holdings, you have to value those cross holdings and bring them in because they're not in your valuation. Yeah. So when you value uh, the sort of fund like Alibaba, do you also value e-commerce and cloud services? What choice do you have? Welcome to Nightmare 101, right? In a sense, to value the search engine that nobody searches on, I've got to use the largest you know, potential high growth online company on the face of the earth, and I've got to bring it into the picture. Right? It is what it is. So let's start this process of discount rates. We won't get very far, but let's start to lay the foundations. So when you talk about discounted cash flow valuations, do discount rates matter? Obviously, it's called discounted cash flow valuation. Having said that, though, I firmly believe that we spend far too much time on discount rates and far too little time on cash flows when we do DC evaluation. If any of you worked in valuation at some point in your lives, think back to the last valuations you did and think of a pie chart of how much time did you spend estimating betas and risk-free rates and risk premiums and cost of capital and how much time you actually spent on your cash flows. And it's completely distorted. And here's why. The median cost of capital of a global company is about 8 to 8.5% 8 in 2019. If you're going to screw up on your valuation, I'm not saying this is a healthy objective, but if, if it's going to screw it's not going to be because you got the discount rate wrong, it's because you got the cash flows horribly wrong. So if you're in a hurry, here's my suggestion. Spend all your time estimating cash flows, just discount it 8 to 8.5%. Eight you're going to be pretty close to the right answer. And then if you have the time, you can finesse and say it's really 7.83% and 9.25%. It'll make you feel good. It'll dazzle your clients and your colleagues. But the reality is the big work in valuation is cash flows. So we're going to spend time on discount rates just to get the process nailed down. And the consistency principle I laid out earlier, I'm going to expand on. Remember the consistency principle is if you have equity cash flows, use the cost of equity. If the cash flows the firm, use the cost of capital. Let me extend that. If your cash flows are in US dollars, your discount rate has to be in US dollars. If your cash flows in euros, they should be in euros. You tell me what currency you do the cash flows in, I'll tell you what, discount, what currency your discount rate should be in. We build on that proposition too. In Latin America, especially after the hyperinflation period in the 1980s and 90s, a lot of analysts started to do everything in real terms. You're saying, what does that mean? When they projected cash flows of the company, they would keep prices constant and for you to grow, then you have to sell more units. So the cash flows are all in real terms. No inflation built in. And if your cash flows are in real terms, your discount rate has to be in real terms as well. I know it sounds kind of abstract, but the first part of what we're going to do is going to bring that in. So let's think about risk before we start putting numbers on risk. The only place to show risk in a traditional discounted cash flow evaluation is the discount rate. You can't show risk in the cash flows because the cash flows are expected cash flows. And if you look at the discount rate, here are the pieces that go into the cost of equity. And the cost of debt is much simpler, so we'll come back to it. To get a risk-adjusted cost of equity, I need first a risk-free rate. Without a risk-free rate, I'm up a creek without a paddle. I can't do anything because the risk-free rate is the base from which I build off. 
Easier in some currencies than others, but that's my starting point. And the risk-free rate has to be in the currency you choose to do the analysis in. Notice what I said. It doesn't have to be in the country that your company is incorporated in. I can value a Russian company in US dollars if that's what I choose to do. The risk-free rate is a currency choice. The other two inputs kind of capture, one will capture your company, the other will capture the market. Let's look at the market number. To get a cost of equity, I also need to know what price risk is attached to in the equity market. What are equity investors demanding as a price for taking on risk? You're saying, what will drive that? Everything on the face of the earth. Every time people panic, that price will go up. It's called an equity risk premium. It's taken for granted in many valuations, but it's actually a current price of equity risk. It's got nothing to do with your company. It's a price of equity in the market. You're saying, what about my company? The last input measures the risk of your company. And I'm going to make it a relative risk number. Relative to the average company, are you riskier, safer? Notice how carefully I'm avoiding a word that you probably have seen in your finance classes so far. What's the word I'm avoiding? Beta. Beta is just a measure of relative risk. to me. The reason I'm avoiding that word is people have all kinds of problems with beta. And I'll kind of open the door and say, these are the problems I too have. But my point is, you don't like betas, throw it out, replace it. I'll give you 11 other ways you can come up with the relative risk measures, which can range from using earnings to debt ratios, whatever you want to use. But ultimately, I need a measure of relative risk. Risk-free rate, equity risk premiums, relative risk. And those are the in ingredients that are going to give me a risk-adjusted discount rate. So before we go into the mechanics of getting a risk-free rate, getting risk premiums, getting a relative risk measure, I'm going to take a closer look at risk slash uncertainty. When you sit down to value a company, here's a cathartic exercise. Sit down and list everything that you're uncertain about in that company. The list will go on and on and on and on, right? I have 50 items on the list. And then here's what I want you to do. Take those 50 items and start putting them into buckets. You're saying, what are you talking about? First, ask yourself, is this risk economic risk or estimation risk? Or as I prefer, economic uncertainty or estimation uncertainty? You're saying, what's the difference? Estimation uncertainty comes from the fact that you haven't done your homework, that you haven't collected enough data. You go out and do more work, more collect more data. Estimation uncertainty, if it doesn't disappear, it will at least get smaller. Economic uncertainty is out of your hands. You sit down to value a Venezuelan company. It's hubris to think that if you build a big enough spreadsheet, uncertainty is going to go away. And the reason I draw this contrast is I'll make a comment about risk. And you can test this out over, over the course of the semester. 90% of the uncertainty you face in valuation is economic uncertainty. And I'm trying to preempt what many of you will try to do as you do valuation. You will feel uncertain. And you know what you'll try to do? Let me go collect more data. Let me talk to more people. Thinking that that's going to make your uncertainty go away. But the reality is most of this uncertainty, you can talk to all the people on the face of the earth and read everything that's out there. It's still going to be there. I take what I call the karmic view when it comes to economic uncertainty. It is what it is. I can't make it go away. So I've got to move on. Knowing when to move on in valuation will let you get the valuation done. Second grouping of uncertainty. Is it micro uncertainty or macro uncertainty? Micro uncertainty is uncertainty specific to the company. How good is the management? How are the projects? Macro uncertainty comes from the Fed, interest rates, you know, exchange rates. And here's why it matters. Micro uncertainty, by definition, affects your firm in ways very different from the rest. So if you have about 50 firms in your portfolio, micro uncertainty is going to cut in different directions. So as you get diversified, what's going to happen to micro uncertainty? The law of large numbers, it's going to average out. It's not magic. It's the reality of large, the law of large numbers. Macro uncertainty, though, you can get as diversified as you want, but you're still going to be exposed. And the reason we draw that contrast is if you're a diversified investor, the only uncertainty that should be in your discount rate is what? Macro, because in a sense, the micro uncertainty is going to get averaged out. Whenever you use betas, whether you like it or not, this is implicitly what we're assuming. I'm going to make it explicit. Because if you're saying, I'm not diversified, can I use this? I'm going to say, well, use it with caution, because this is from the perspective of a diversified investor. Is it micro or macro? The third set of buckets, I'm going to divide uncertainty into discrete uncertainty and continuous uncertainty. And I'll give you the easiest way to think about the contrast. 
I think about 20 years ago, a lot of, cur lot of currencies around the world had fixed exchange rates. The government set the exchange rate. So if you invested in that country, because the exchange rate was fixed, you felt no risk, you felt no risk, you felt no risk, until you felt a lot of risk. Why? Because currencies would get devalued. That's discrete uncertainty. It's uncertainty that doesn't happen most of the time, but when it does happen, it's big and it's explosive. In contrast, think about a US company that has European operations. Every minute of every day, that company's value is changing because the euro dollar exchange rate varies every minute. It's a continuous exposure. If you're sitting down to value a company, which of these uncertainties do you think is easier to work with? Continuous uncertainty or discrete uncertainty? Continuous. In fact, everything we know in finance is built for continuous uncertainties. It's one of my pet peeves with how we think about risk is it's designed for continuous uncertainty. So if I ask you to value a company that's subject to nationalization risk, and you say, how do I bring it into discount rates? The answer is you cannot bring it into discount rates because discount rates were never designed for that kind of risk. I give you a distressed company where what you're worried about is, will this company make it? It's discrete risk. It's very difficult to bring. But we have to deal with this in valuation. So we're going to talk about how best to deal with discrete risk. And you're going to see that the tools we're going to use don't come from finance. They come from probability and statistics. So if you give me a young pharma company with a patent working its way through the pipeline, what are the risks I'm worried about? It's a risk that you will not make it through stage one, stage two, stage three, which means I've got to bring in tools that finance right now doesn't have as financial tools. Now some general perspectives on risk. And this is something that I'm going to state up front, and you'll have to wrestle with it until you get comfortable. When you invest in a company, your first reaction is, I'm exposed to all the risk, reward me. Okay. And we're going to argue that not all risk counts. That if you choose to put all your money in one company, you chose to do it, don't ask me to reward you for that risk. The analogy I would offer, and this is a terrible analogy, it's like buying a house across the, across the street from your brokerage house, across a six-lane highway. And here's what you do every morning. You get up and you run across a six-lane highway. You might make it, you might not. The end of the year, you come back and tell me, look, I took a lot of risk this year investing. I'd run across a six-lane highway every day. I should be making at least a 50% return on stocks, but I'm not. And I'm going to tell you, well, don't run across a six-lane highway. You chose to do that. We're going to argue that you can't bring your pet peeves and your pet feelings about how you think about investing into the way you think about risk. So you might decide that you want to put all your money in one stock, but that's your choice. Don't expect the market to reward you for a choice you didn't have to take. Second, when we think about valuing a company, again, a first instinct is to think about risk through our own eyes. But remember, you're a price taker. You know what I mean by a price taker? I invest in Apple. I don't set the price of Apple. It's a market. So when I value Apple, the risk I have to bring into my valuation is not what do I think about risk, but what is the marginal investor in the company? Investors who can drive prices, who tend to be large institutional investors who think about risk. And that's where the diversification story comes in. I'm not going to argue. You know what the typical investor in the US holds, how many stocks they hold in the portfolio. These are active investors who actually go out and buy stocks. You know what the typical number of stocks in the portfolio of an individual is? Three to five. So if you said, are investors diversified? You can say, of course they're not. But you know why it doesn't matter in valuation? When you think about who sets prices, it's not these individuals who own three to five stocks, but the Fidelities, the State Streets, the Black Rocks of the world. And guess what? They don't own three to five stocks, I hope. They own hundreds of stocks. The diversification argument is not the absurd one of everybody's diversified and holds a market portfolio. It says enough investors are diversified with setting prices that I have to be a price taker. So every single risk and return model, if you look at the, the build up to the model, is built on the same foundation. It starts with the risk free rate. Arbitrage pricing model, multi. I mean, how many sessions did you, I won't say waste, but spend on going through model after model? Same base. The only difference between the models is how they measure the risk that cannot be diversified away. In the CAPM, it's all measured with one or captured in one number, the beta. In a multi factor model, it's captured with five or six betas. In an arbitrage pricing model, it's five, 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 or six fact, five or six betas, but on factors that are not named. Every single risk and return model is built on a diversified investor base. 
The only alternative to any of these models is to just let the market tell you what's risky or safe. What does that mean? Look back at the last 50 years, see what kinds of companies are in high returns, or small cap stocks. They must be riskier than large cap. These are called proxy models. It's so essentially you're letting some observable characteristics of the company tell you what the cost, but they're all built around the same foundations of how we think about risk. So I'm going to stop there because next session when we start, we're going to start with the notion of I need a risk free rate because there's a, so we'll start with the risk free rates next session and then move it to risk premiums and measuring relative risk. Okay. They read it the less. Every time they read it, the less they might wipe out anything. They should be doing it. But I did, I'll go, I'll check because I did add you to the Google mail list. No, I'll, I'll do it. Thank you. What do you do with leveraging the free cash flow to equity models? How do you, I don't know, do you stabilize the leverage or? That's, you have to bring in it. The leverage is changing. So you have to bring in the debt effect into the cash flow. So if you're increasing debt ratios, debt will become a cash inflow. But in, in perpetuity, I don't know. Well, it's got to be steady state. Then you can't have a changing debt rate. You can't have a changing debt rate. Nothing can change in perpetuity. So you find like a capital structure and then and live with you that. do it. 30% debt, and that's what it will be for the rest of the economy. You cannot have anything changing. And that's not just leverage. Your margins can't. In fact, everything yeah, has yeah. to get locked in, including the debt ratio. And that's true in the cost of capital calculation as well, right? Because you need a debt ratio there as well. So your debt ratio can change over the next five or 10 years in a cost of capital, but once you get to terminal value, you're locked in. And in the free cash flow to equity, you are assuming that you are gonna get this money back, like it's, you have to pay like in dividends. That's an assumption of the free cash flow to equity, no? No, even if you don't get it back, you own the cash. So in Apple, you don't have to get the cash back, right? You own a portion of the 245, as long as that's built into the stock price, it doesn't even have to get paid up, uh -huh. right? Because yeah. you are part owner of the cash. Okay. So it uh, doesn't require that the cash ever be returned. It just means that you at least have to be given credit for holding the cash. If markets are not giving you credit, then you can say, well, the company should be paying the cash back. And that's going to be the dividing line for why some companies, you put pressure to get the cash back. Because markets might not be giving them the full credit of cash because they don't trust them with the cash. But if you're trusted with the cash, cash is going to show up in the stock price. So when you pay $170 for Apple, you're actually getting $34 of cash and $136 yeah, yeah. of operating cash. Thank you. Yes? Hi, could you speak a little bit? You spoke about the macro price. Mm -hmm. Could you speak a little bit about the which data, the beta? Macro risk. Only macro risk shows up in the beta. Ma by definition, beta measures risk that cannot be diversified away. Macro risk cannot be diversified, right? Because but, but like also Tesla, like had its like uh, it, like Elon Musk tweets about Tesla. Um, the stock price changes, so by definition. No, no, that can affect cash flows. I mean, remember the discount rate is only a piece of the puzzle. Every time he tweets, it's about cash flow. So he says the Tesla trees were having trouble. That's a cash flow issue, right there. You don't need to dis even bring discount rates into the equation, right? So when he says, we're having trouble delivering 5,000 cars, there goes your revenue projection for next year. And since so much of the value rides in the revenue projection, okay. your value is very quickly going to react as well. Okay. So it's not a risk effect you're seeing with the tweets. Okay. Unless it's a discrete risk. Like when he t t tweeted out the um, funding lined up, you know, is funding secured for... You are treading on very dangerous ground because technically you are, I mean, to be viewed as market manipulation, the discrete risk you then face is the SEC could come in and replace him as a manager. It will not show up in the discount rate, but it could show up very quickly in the kinds of cash flows you think Tesla will have if Elon Musk is not around. So I think he, the, the risk effects he creates are either discrete risk because he's playing with fire in some of these tweets or on the cash flows. Yeah, so when he talks about manufacturing hell, what's he telling you? Okay. He's telling you we're having a really tough time on that floor getting the cars out, which is a cost of goods sold problem. And, okay. yeah. okay. and I was also wondering, do you have a question about mm -hmm. the retail um, sector mm -hmm. the project performance? Like that's the, that doesn't have to be a sector overlay. For the valuation project, you can pick whatever companies you want. All you have to do is meet 
the requirements of one money losing company. So you can pick five very different sectors okay. as long as you meet the money loser, the foreign company, and the service company. I think one of the criteria is to pick like a BPA, I mean, sorry, a service company. A service company. company. Yeah. Service is so broadly defined, yeah. pretty much. It's a That's very, in fact, if I said pick a manufacturing company, it would have been a tougher problem right. because there's the relatively few. Right. I mean, yeah, that's lots of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, like, yeah. 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 Okay. Everything, uh, retail is service, I mean, all, 80% of the economy is service, so. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Just about the control premium discussion, so mm -hmm. you don't like the 20% benchmark, what do you think that should be like an overall? I just told, I told you. Why should there be a benchmark? You've got a value control, value the damn thing. Why do you need a benchmark? But how do you evaluate it? For instance, like you calculate the synergies and you assume that... You, you tell them, how did I value...